Hello there, my name is Jack Hare and today I'm going to talk to you about some new experiments that we've been doing at the Magpie Pulse Power Facility at Imperial College in London. We've been generating and diagnosing turbulence in pulse power driven magnetised plasmas. Before I start, I'd like to particularly thank Guy Berdiak, Jack Halliday and Stefano Molini for designing these experiments, collecting the data and for helping me to analyse it. Just to summarise briefly what I'm going to show you in this talk, we've been able to generate turbulence by colliding a magnetized plasma with a planar obstacle. We observe velocity and density fluctuations using Thomson scattering and using a new diagnostic that we call an imaging refractometer. As well as presenting results from all of these diagnostics, I'll also discuss some possible mechanisms which can produce the turbulence which we observe. Our source of plasma for these experiments is an exploding wire array. This is a cylindrical cage of thin wires surrounding a thick central conductor. The current passes up through the wires and returns to ground through the conductor. And as it does so, it ionizes the surface of the wires, creating a coronal plasma, which takes a fraction of the drive current. At the same time, there's a very large magnetic field generated around the central cathode. And so the magnetic field interacts with the current in the wires to produce a radial J cross B force, which accelerates the plasma outwards. As the plasma is accelerated outwards, it drags with it a fraction of that driving magnetic field. And so the exploding wire array is a source of diverging azimuthally magnetized plasma. And the plasma is continually ablated from the wires for the 500 nanosecond drive time of the Magpie facility. Now, in the experiments I'm gonna show you today, we had a very simple experimental geometry. We placed a planar conducting obstacle about 10 millimeters away from the wire array. And we watched the plasma collide with this conducting obstacle. In this talk, I'm gonna show you diagnostics from two principal orthogonal lines of sight. One is the end on direction, looking down onto the plasma from above onto the magnetic fields lying in the plane. The other is the side on direction. Here we're looking at the plasma from the side, the magnetic fields point out of the page. And so we'll be switching back and forth between these two perspectives and hopefully this diagram will make it easier to keep track of where we are. So starting with Sidon, this is a cartoon of what we expect to see. We have a magnetized plasma flow colliding with a conducting obstacle. We expect the magnetic field and the pressure to build up next to the target and launch a reverse shock, which propagates back upstream into the flow. And indeed, when we carry out this experiment using an aluminium plasma, using aluminium wires, we see exactly that the flow comes in, it collides with the target, and it produces this very narrow, well-defined shock, which propagates back upstream. So far, so good. However, when we swap out the aluminium wires for tungsten wires, but keep everything else the same in this experiment, we see something very dramatic. We see instead of a nice, stable, well-defined shock, we see this very unstable plasma with structure on all of the resolved length scales. And so the question that I'm posing in this talk is, why does this happen? Why does our plasma go stable? And we're going to tackle that using a range of different diagnostics. So to start with looking end on onto the plasma from above using our laser interferometry. On the left here, we have the raw interferogram. You can see the light and dark interference fringes, which corresponds to a phase shift between the probing laser that goes through the plasma and the reference laser that goes around. By unfolding these phase shifts, these interference fringe distortions, we can get out the line integrated electron density shown here on the right. You can see these jets of plasma coming out from each of the wires. The jets are very well collimated, they don't interact with each other, and they don't expand very much. They collide with the target here at zero millimeters on the right hand side. They produce a very dense layer of plasma that we can't probe through because our probing laser beam is refracted out of our collection optics. But you can see here at around about minus one and a half millimeters that we can get the signal back and you can see indeed we're ramping up to a very dense region here. What's remarkable about this end-on interferometry is how little structure we see here compared to the side-on stratigraphy that I showed you here. Here we see an awful lot of structure, mostly arranged in the vertical direction. Now this diagnostic integrates in the vertical direction and so that may wash out these density perturbations or it may be that we don't have many density perturbations in uh, this plane at all and that the structure of the instability is mostly in the z direction. What we can get out from these interferograms is an average density of around 5 times 10 to the 17 electrons per cubic centimeter which we'll use later to calculate several important dimensionless parameters. 
We can also probe side on, so this is the orthogonal line of sight again, using our Faraday rotation diagnostic. This consists of a laser beam which passes through the plasma and it's split to do interferometry and also to do two-channel polarimetry here. The polarimetry measures the angle of rotation of a linearly polarized probing laser beam as it passes through the plasma. That angle of rotation alpha is proportional to the line integral of the electron density and the components of the magnetic field along our probing laser beam. And you can see that this uh, polarization angle has an awful lot of structure here. It's, it seems to be fluctuating quite wildly. You can also see in the interferometry that our electron density must be fluctuating quite wildly as well. So it's entirely possible that all of this fluctuations in the rotation angle are simply due to the contributions from the electron density. The magnetic field itself could be rather smooth. And I'll come back to that later when I talk about the Reynolds, magnetic Reynolds number of this flow. For now, we're just going to take a representative average uh, rotation angle of around about 1.3 degrees. And in combination with our line integrated electron density, which we get from the endon interferometry here, we can work out an average magnetic field of around about five Tesla. And that's confirmed by measurements using B dot probes and Faraday rotation in other experiments where the plasma is more stable. We can also carry out Thompson scattering in these experiments. I'll start by showing you the case where there is no target, and so the flows coming out from the exploding wire array uh, just propagate out undisturbed into the vacuum. We pass our probing laser beam down through the center of one of these flows, and we collect the scattered light at 90 degrees using a linear fiber optic bundle. So we actually collect the light from 14 distinct spatial locations along this probing laser beam. Because we're collecting light at 90 degrees, the resultant Doppler shifts are due to velocities along this k vector, and so we need to do a little bit of trigonometry to get the velocity out along the flow multiplied by square root 2. When we do that, we can see, get the velocity from the Doppler shift of the Thomson scattering spectrum. The wires are over here at about minus 10 millimeters, and so you can see that the flow gradually accelerates away from the wire array out into space. This gradually expands. This gradual acceleration is due to the fact that there is still magnetic fields dragged within these flows, and so there's a J cross B force acting on the plasma, constantly accelerating it outwards. Now, if we do this Thompson scattering measurement in a plasma where there is a target in the way, we can see that to start with, the flow is very, very similar. It's also accelerating outwards, but around about minus three, minus four millimeters, we see a change. The flow suddenly begins to decelerate, and indeed, very close to the target here, we see the flow coming back the other way. It's changed direction. Well, at the same time in this experiment we captured Sidon shadography, which I'm showing here, and you can see that this turbulent region on the right starts around 3.5 millimeters away from uh, the target. And so that's exactly the location where we start to see these velocities drop down. Now um, we can look in more detail exactly what's going on with the Thompson scattering signal in this region here. So at these two points um, and I've just actually drawn the collection volume here. Uh, so we're collecting just behind the, the front where the turbulence seems to start. And these are what the two Thompson scattering signals look like. We've got the response function drawn here in black of the spectrometer, that's our effective resolution. And then we've got in blue um, the, the Thompson scattering signal when there is no target, so the undisturbed flow. There's negligible broadening in this signal. It's basically the same width as our response function. So we know the plasma is relatively cold, less than about 10 electron volts in the electrons and in the ions. Now, in the case where there is a target, we see significant broadening here. And this corresponds to a temperature of around 100 EV. Now, I've put uh, temperature in quotation marks here because there are many things which can act as a source of broadening of our Thomson scattering signal. It doesn't just have to be random thermal motions from a Maxwellian. What I've drawn here is a sort of sample collection volume, and you can see three different types of flow within this collection volume, which could account for the same sorts of broadening. We could have sheared flows where the flow is highly organized, but the magnitude of velocity changes across the collection volume. We could have turbulent flows where we have these vortices on all sorts of different length scales down to the dissipation scale where the viscosity takes over. This will also cause a significant amount of signal. And then finally, there's thermal motion. That's kind of what we're trying to measure with Thompson scattering, completely random motion, where we're assuming that there's high enough collisionality that we have a Maxwellian. So we can't distinguish between these three different types of broadening uh, with a single measurement. So what we're going to try and do now is show some evidence for turbulent fluctuations in the density, a completely different measurement using a completely different diagnostic. But if we can show that, it will give some evidence that maybe 
these uh, this temperature is at least in part due to thermal, uh, sorry, due to turbulence uh, within the plasma. So this new diagnostic I'm talking about is our imaging refractometer. I'm only going to go through this very quickly. If you want more details, then Stefano Malini has a poster in this conference. It was already a few days ago, but you can still go check out the poster and have a chat with him about it. And we also have a paper on the archive that we put up a couple of months ago describing it. Now, in this diagnostic, we pass a, a collimated laser beam through the plasma, and density fluctuations within the plasma deflect the rays that make up that laser beam. I've drawn on a few example rays here. Green one is undeflected rays, uh, and the orange and the red ones are rays which are being deflected uh, by a density fluctuation, either on axis or off axis. Now, looking at uh, this diagram here, it looks like a very simple two lens telescope. We have a first lens which makes an image plane, there's a distance L behind it, and we have a second lens which images that image plane onto our CCD. So far, so standard. This looks like laser stratigraphy. However, this second lens here is a composite lens. It actually consists of a cylindrical and spherical lens placed back to back. And so its focal lens differs in the two orthogonal axes. In this axis, it has a relatively uh, short focal length, and so it makes an image of the image plane. But in this axis, it's a weaker lens. And so as opposed to making an image of the image plane, it makes an image of this Fourier plane, which forms behind the first lens. And it images this onto our CCD. What that effectively means is in the imaging axis here, uh, the position of the rays on the CCD depends on where they emerged from the plasma. But in the orthogonal or Fourier axis here, the position of the rays on the CCD depends on the angle they made when they left the plasma. And so we have a hybrid image which has spatial resolution in one direction and angular resolution in the orthogonal direction. What I'm gonna do is show you some example data from this diagnostic. Hopefully that will make this a little bit clearer. This example data, I've already shown you the stratigraphy. We take a beam splitter, so we actually simultaneously do stratigraphy and imaging refractometry on the same laser beam. So these are from exactly the same time and exactly the same plasma. We can learn a lot by comparing these two images. In the stratigraphy, you can see the flow coming in from the left-hand side here is very laminar, and it collides with the target and makes this very turbulent region. In the imaging refractometer, you can see a very similar story. The flow comes in from the left, and there are, the rays are mostly landing near zero deflection angle because they're mostly undisturbed here. However, once we get into the turbulent region, the broadening is significant. The rays are being deflected more and more by the cumulative effect of all of those density fluctuations in the plasma. We can make this a bit more quantitative by looking at a line out uh, of this imaging refractometer data. And you can see that in blue. This is the distribution of deflection angles we see at this spatial location. Now, in the absence of a plasma, we get this green line here, the undeflected um, rays, and that's very, very narrow. And our signal here is 200 times broader than this. So we have a very high dynamic range. We can measure very small angles of deflection uh, with this. We've got a very small uh, response function. But what we need is a theory which links the distribution of these deflection angles to the spectrum of density fluctuations within the plasma. Now, that's easy to do if we think there's only a single density gradient of the plasma, we can just work out the deflection angle from a single density gradient. But what we expect, of course, is that our probing laser beam will interact with many density fluctuations along the way. Uh, and so we'll have something a bit like a random walk that should give this distribution as being roughly Gaussian. However, when we try and fit this with a Gaussian, we find that a spectrum is very non-Gaussian. It's actually got very broad tails to it. And that's extremely interesting because this gives us evidence for intermittency within the plasma. In turbulence, we know that there are intermittent effects. There are long-lived coherent structures, which means that the density fluctuations don't follow a Gaussian distribution, but they have these long tails out to the side. The fact that we've been able to observe this in our imaging refractometer diagnostic suggests that we really do have uh, some interesting turbulence effects going on within this plasma, and that complements our measurements of broadening from Thompson scattering. So putting all of this together, these are the measured parameters we have, the density of around five times 10 to the 17 per cubic centimeter from uh, the interferometry, our magnetic field around five Tesla from Faraday rotation imaging, our velocity of around 50 kilometers per second at the front where the turbulence begins from Thompson scattering. And I'm giving some example temperatures here of around 10 electron volts for the electron temperature, 
and we're using this roughly 100 electron volts for the ion temperature. These are relatively hard to constrain, as we already discussed, but this is just so I can calculate some of these dimensionless parameters on the right. You can see using these parameters that our flow is significantly supersonic and superalphanic. That means the round pressure dominates over the magnetic and thermal pressures in this plasma. We have our electron hole parameter on the order of one, which means that the um, magnetic field is only weakly constraining conduction perpendicular to the field. So you really, this is quite a collisional plasma. We don't expect the magnetic field to play a big role in the heat transfer. We have a resistive length scale of around one millimeter. This is the length scale on which the magnetic Reynolds number is one, which means that the discus terms and the advective terms are roughly the same. It also means that on this length scale, the density and velocity fluctuations decouple from the magnetic field. And so we can have turbulence in the velocity and density while still having smooth magnetic fields. And I talked about this earlier with reference to our polarimetry data. We have an ion skin depth of around 1.5 millimeters. That means that on this length scale, the ions and the electrons can move separately, which means that um, we can see two fluid effects probably in this plasma. However, we do have a very short ion-ion mean free path. Means the plasma is mostly going to have a Maxwellian distribution. We don't expect to see exotic kinetic effects associated with interesting and complicated distribution functions. Finally, the electron-ion equilibration time scale is relatively long compared to the other time scales in this experiment. It means we could expect the electrons and the ions to have different temperatures. We don't have to put these two temperatures to be exactly the same. So to summarize, this is a sort of collisional, weakly magnetized plasma dominated by round pressure. And the turbulence we see is at or below the resistive length scale. And so the magnetic field can do its own thing. It can be very smooth, while the density and the velocity can be very um, turbulent and stochastic still. So what exactly is causing these observed density perturbations that you see using our uh, shadography and imaging refractometer? Well, at first, when we saw these elongated structures, we thought of the ion viable instability, which forms uh, uh, filaments when you have counter-propagating streams of ions. However, this plasma is very collisional. It seems very unlikely the ion viable could be active here. Now, very early in time, when the density is lower, we might be in a collisionless regime and we might have reflected ions which could cause the ion viable instability. Indeed, in aluminium plasmas, this has been observed. Uh, this is a paper from Sergei Lebedev in 2014. And so it's possible that at early times we could have the ion viable setting up a structure which persists until later times when the collisionality increases. But we don't have any evidence for that at the moment. This is just one possibility. Another possibility is a radiative cooling instability. Here, a region of the plasma becomes colder um, by fluctuations, and it's compressed by the surrounding plasma. And as it's compressed, it radiates way more energy, and that compression continues. And so you have this runaway in instability, which causes dense regions of uh, plasma to form. But there's no good reason why these dense regions should be perpendicular to the magnetic field. And we do see that there's a lot of structure in this horizontal direction. So it's not clear why the radiative cooling instability would cause this sort of structure to form. And finally, we could look at something like a current-driven instability. These current-driven instabilities are well known in the Z-Pinch community. They're reviewed by Ryotov in 2000, uh, if you want to know more about them. But as a little cartoon here, there are two types of structures that form in these instabilities. In materials where the resistivity increases with temperature, that's things like metals, uh, you expect to have striations. The current will av avoid this hot region here and uh, go around it, which will heat the edges of it, and so the striation will Row. And so you'll have structures which are horizontal, perpendicular to the magnetic field. In materials where the resistivity decreases with temperature, like a plasma, we expect filaments to form. current will be focused into these hot regions and will extend it parallel to the current. However, what we observe is striations perpendicular to the current, not filaments parallel to the current. And that's quite surprising in a plasma. So unless there's some effect, which means that our resistivity is in fact increasing with temperature, so decreasing with temperature, we still don't fully understand this. So I'm gonna summarize now. I've shown you a magnetized tungsten plasma colliding with a planar obstacle and becoming very unstable. We've been able to measure the density, the magnetic field and the flow velocity uh, within this plasma. And we've been able to especially observe broadening in the Thomson scattering signal. It's not clear what the source of that is, but it could be turbulence in the velocity field. I've also shown you a new diagnostic, an imaging refractometer, which provides evidence for turbulence by looking at the spectrum of deflections of a probing laser beam which passes through plasma.
Now, the mechanisms for generating this turbulence are still extremely unclear. I gave three possibilities, but we don't really have any definitive answer yet. So I welcome any suggestions and any questions, and thank you very much for listening to my talk.